chat. It's so good to have you here on the 20th of September. Uh, and we've got a really big program lined up for you tonight. And, and I've got Kevin Newton here from Australia Survival Instructors. But before I jump over and we uh, introduce Kevin, I want to give you all a little bit of uh, information on what's coming up. So spring is here. This is a really good time to um, get out and about, get in nature, start preparing. And what we're doing with all of that is getting set up for the challenge. Now, you may have heard of the challenge. You may not have heard of the challenge. But what that is is, is practicing going without electricity and water, so running water or tap water, and your bed for just 48 hours. Now I'm challenging you all to that. I did this challenge a year ago and it was so good for my family. Uh, we uh, had a really fun time with it and we just did it from our own home. Um, we didn't go anywhere. We just we went, went for a hike. That was kind of like the extent of going out. So you can do this challenge right around Australia, wherever you are, even overseas if you want to join in as well. That's absolutely fine. And it's called the 72-hour kit challenge because we're really learning about how to get our grab-and-go bag, our emergency kit together so that we can be ready and prepared for any occasion or emergency. So we have, if you're in the Sydney area, we have a beautiful location for our camping experience because uh, it's so much more fun when you can get out in nature and experience um, actually being without electricity and without running water and take it into the bush and be in nature. So I'll share with you these photos. If you're are in and around, anywhere around in New South Wales or around Sydney, you might want to jump in and come with us. Um, and this is in our Telegram group. Um, so some of these photos were taken. Okay, can you guys see that one? These were taken uh, back in, let's say, March um, this year where a, a big festival was held called Unity. And this is at St. Albans, which is between Wiseman's Ferry and Mangrove Mountain, I guess you could say. Um, it's about 90 kilometers north of Sydney, no, sorry, 90 minutes, so not far out, um, and a beautiful big property. That's where we'll be setting up our tents on the on the grassy area where you can see in that picture. Um, it's loading up. So there's a nice scan of that. And you can see by all the cars how many people are, are there that weekend. And actually setting up for a... Um, a big ceremony in that picture. There's Uncle Cole and Red. He's the one, he's a caretaker of the property. Oh, that's a bit of fun of the actual ceremony itself. And I'll just move through that. But what I wanted to share with you is there are our toilets. So we're not roughing it too badly because um, they're, you know, s separate cubicles. Um, they are composting toilets. There's even a ramp. How about that? Um, there's a IBC tank on the side. So it's not classed as running water because it's not out of the tap, but it's not without its comforts. But even better than that, Oh, there you can see that's a better shot of the IBC tank in that one. There's a beach. Now, if you can see at the end of that track, there's a there's a there's like a lagoon and beautiful white sand. But now with all the floods and the rains and so forth, where those trees are, the sand comes right up there and even um, closer to where you could see those toilets were built. So that is all sandy now. Okay, so that's a better look at the actual beach. 
and the water it's a it's the the sand is quite aerated though that's the only thing is that when we there's not been too many people walking down around there so once we head down there we'll we'll go stand on the beach and it's quite it's quite fluffy at the moment but that's where we're planning to go for our uh, 14th to the 16th of October um, on the for the Friday to the Sunday you can camp the Friday and Saturday and stay the Sunday or the Saturday Sunday whatever works for you so that is where we're going and so in lead up to that this is week three of our training all about getting prepared to how do you survive <laughs> without electricity and water and I was telling Kevin about this our 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 challenge it's like that's how he lives all the time <laughs> it's a cinch right Kevin it's not a well, yeah not live um I live in a we live in an ordinary place but when we do all the courses yeah there's no no electricity no no uh, water on tap um no proper beds so it's just perfectly normal perfectly uh, normal now we're yeah. also doing that um this weekend we're actually going to do a permaculture course and that's out at um, the Grove which is at Wiseman's Ferry and I posted a few um, pictures of, or a nice little video of that but it's a beautiful property called the Grove and um, and so that's where we're going to be camping this weekend again without electricity but with beautiful composting toilets so you know we're not roughing it too badly at all um and so you know i want to check out that on that on the web on the telegram group for those details there now i did invite kevin to come and talk to us because he's like you said running survival camps um quite often one day events four day events um so Kevin, tell us why is learning about survival more important now than ever? Uh, why now? I think um, I think the past couple of years, obviously with all of the um, the the stuff that's been happening, uh, it's it's really really had an impact on um, why people want to get outdoors and learn not just. Uh, survival because I mean at the end of the day survival is just not dying so that applies to anyone whether you're into doing like bushwalking or, or anything um, but more so bush skills long-term bush skills what we call long-term primitive skills people are more interested in, in doing that and becoming self-reliant um, getting out of the cities uh, I think we're probably all on the same page here we know what's going on. We know why people do want to get out of the cities, um, especially after all the big massive lockdowns and keeping people prisoners. So there's a mass exodus of, of not just people moving out, but also a big interest and big surge of interest in learning all of this stuff um, from city people mainly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting to see. It's like we were talking the other day, Kelly, it's just, I've noticed we've been doing this for 11 years. And in those days, it was, it was, um, it was a little bit different. It was like outdoorsy people, people, young guys wanting to join the army, things like that, <laughs> or used to be Bear Grylls fans. Uh, nowadays there's two, there's two types we get. There's fans of a show called Alone, which is, uh, SBS have picked that up recently. It's been that's been going for about ten years, and that's ten contestants who go out with ten items and self film uh, and try to stay out in the bush as long as possible. There's a huge interest in that uh, due to SBS picking it up. But um, the next major thing is just ordinary families wanting to just get out, you know, get out of the bush, uh, get out into the bush um, from from the cities and from all that control, all that. Are we allowed to swear? <laughs> so, what is it that you teach on your courses? Um, well, we've got various ones. So, the, you know, there's one day, two day, four day survival. We've got uh, three day primitive skills ones, which is a, a, a sort of tags along to the survival stuff um, where it's a lot of hands on making things. So, survival stuff, it's the, the, the typical stuff, you know. Um, 
prioritising uh, fire, shelter, water, um, rescue, which means signalling. Obviously, health, uh, health and medical emergencies are always number one. Um, so uh, shelter, you know, that's where people may have to look for shelter or build shelter. Um, water is all, you know, procuring it, treating it or modern equipment to treat it. Um, navigation as well. We're big on navigation, old school navigation. So map and compass stuff. Um, and just trying to think. I mean, there's a whole bunch of, of subjects we do. We do way more on the four day. Like the one day is is like an introduction to all of those things, you know, um, um, fire, shelter, water, um, get modern gear, starting with the clothing that you, you've got on your back, a um, bit of navigation, a little bit of food foraging, what we show what's there. Like a, there's a huge interest in bush tucker, but it's not like just a supermarket. You can go out and pick things. People don't realise that. The, things are very seasonal and things are maybe far apart um yeah so um i'm just trying to think of anything that would be sort of out of the ordinary that people wouldn't expect um there's probably a few more things on the long four day survival course we do that no one else does in australia which would be a bit of stone technology so if you don't have a knife we, we teach geology and how to make um you know things out of uh, stones uh, as our ancestors did we do game preparations of butchering and skinning um, tanning a uh, little bit of uh, web primitive weapons so we take students through a 3d uh, animal so 3d means rubber animal range where they don't know where the animals are they've got to spot them uh, and then obviously have a go at shooting them with primitive bows um, so things like that, yeah. So the, so the one day is the basics. They get, a, they get a feel for, you know, each subject, a bit of, lots of information thrown at them. There's no hands-on stuff for things like shelter building because you need literally minimum half a day to build a proper one if you are going to start from scratch, which I don't recommend because nature usually provides a lot of uh, things that you can use. Yeah, so I can keep rambling, but <laughs> hopefully that gives a sort of a... A quick rundown of what we do um oh we also do offshoot courses of actual bow making uh when when i say bow making i mean like primitive bows like made out of timber from the bush so we show people how to source australian timbers which a lot of people don't realize we actually have very good bow timbers here um and, and we also bow, do bow for shooting bow, the bow and arrow yeah, archery archery yeah. yeah archery yeah yeah so we we there's not too many people doing that normally any any bow courses they're just buying timber from the timber mill but we actually chop specific timbers out of the bush and and, and uh, prepare staves for the students uh, we've also got a really basic prim, um, blacksmithing course which is like a hand crank blower old coal sort of forge very very basics um, yeah and they're sort of offshoots from running the courses for so long a lot we would get feedback for like oh, i'd love to do something else or you know who made the bows that was we'd get that a lot years ago who made the bows and when we saw oh, we do oh you should teach that so we sort of started doing that we've got of plans of doing um a um advanced survival because we've taught so many people stuff over the years that um you know people often come back to you know three four five courses um, we're planning an advanced one where only ex-students or very, or we may have to vet uh, individuals um, to come back and do, yeah, sort of a, a proper sort of close on your back um, advanced one. So they'll be, they have to be doing navigating through the bush off track, obviously from campsite to campsite, which won't be prepped for them. Um, it'll be literally sleeping where we stop, whether it be an overhang like in the sort of a cave type overhang or just even the bare scrub um yeah so that that's uh, looking forward to that one that'll be a good one and also along the way they're going to have to um obviously choose their timber for fire making primitive fire making like hand drill or bow drill so and any other uh, material they think may come in handy and you know like cordage for making fishing lines um so yeah that's that's on the cards as well cool so we do a lot we do a lot <laughs> I might share the screen and we'll go to your website actually. Okay. And 
and uh, show everyone what that looks like. Let me make sure I've got it ready to go. Um, there it is. We've got a few photos. I've got your gallery up there, so we'll go to that. Well, that'll be old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, the the um the thing is, is that like, the first photo that we come to is this beautiful girl making fire, and the, the first thing I notice is. When anyone can make fire, you feel like you've conquered, you know, Mount Everest. That's that's the biggest thing, isn't it? There's such a good feeling when you go, I, I made fire. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I never get sick of seeing their faces. It's um, it's pretty special because uh, it's sort of that feeling that oh, you know, like people say, oh, it's caveman type stuff. It is. It's in all of us. It's in our genetics. And when they do it, it's you can tell straight up. It's something deep within. And the joy they get knowing that they can, you know, pretty much just rub sticks together. Um, yeah, yeah, amazing. And then, and then that, the that was quite a few years back, that one. Yeah, yeah, these are quite old photos, some of these. I'll need to update them. But this one, this TP one, this is making shelter, right? The one on the left, my left. Yep. That's a, that's a um, tripod for smoking fish smoking fish ah. yeah. yeah and the students built this and you can see they've put some uh guy mere lily leaves around the back to stop the wind i see yeah so that was uh smoking fish that smoked those for probably about half a day fantastic uh, night lessons yeah you can see that we we do um we have a generator out there so we light it up at night for night lessons they sometimes can go quite late actually it de depends on students interest but um yeah we were teaching on the last blacksmithing course till about 11 30 teaching a lot of uh, formal stuff that's where we do all the formal lessons so so like classroom type lessons um and so quite uh, quite often uh the the day will start with a debrief of what uh what happened the day before and then what's going to come ahead so that'll always happen there. It's, it's just a good spot to, to bring everybody together um, because the students do camp out in three different spots according to the, this is the four day course, uh, according to the level of experience. So we, we split them up and we have sort of on the four day beginner, intermediate and advanced so that everybody goes away happy because some people find it too hard, some people would find it too easy and now we sort of let people experience how they want so that they all go away happy and you've got quite a few instructors there it looks like yeah yeah we we've always i've always been of the opinion that you know um yes i could do it on my own but it would always be small um so and because i did start the company with my brother uh, and another guy who, no, who are no longer with us um we were always that's why we chose the name because it wasn't just one person um and now we've got uh yeah i mean young zach he he's been with us since day dot so he's the original one that was always with us um and then we've got uh another fellow mick who used to work uh, at a survivor school up in queensland um for an ex military guy i don't know whether he's still operating i won't mention names or anything um not quite sure what he's doing now but mick spent a year probably about nine months working for him and lived in a excuse me a little um lean-to that he built uh. so he actually lived in it so you guys will be spending 48 hours in no electricity imagine living in it for i think it was a minimum of six months wow uh, and his water was you know down by the river and um he was happy as larry living in his lean-to so that's Mick, that's one of our instructors. And then we've got um, young Maddie, who's a female instructor, who's also qualified. Um, she teaches rock climbing. Uh, she's a qualified guide in New Zealand, um, seen many rescues. Um, and she was a student. You can see her on the left, actually, now with the ASI staff. Uh -huh. Yeah, she's, she's really good. She bow hunts as well. She's really into bow hunting. Ah, that's Jo on the right. Yeah, she teaches bush tucker. But she hasn't done much lately because she's she's doing a lot of stuff, um, her own stuff. She's been sort of adopted by an Aboriginal mob up north and she's got herself a dingo. So <laughs> oh, 
she's doing her own thing. <laughs> they live and breathe it, don't they? Oh yeah, all our instructors do. This is it. We this and this is the passion that students see when they come along. They just go like, "You guys are so passionate about what you do." And it's like, yeah, because we we pretty much live, eat, shit, and breathe it. It's not we don't. There's no pretending, you know. Yeah. Um, and we love getting great students who are just as passionate too, because like it's just it's it's a it's a nice feeling. It gives me a lot of satisfaction, and this is why I do it because, um just seen students faces and and i've we've got feedback sometimes um that it's been life-changing for them and i mean i don't really go into depth about why their life was so miserable beforehand but <laughs> but it's a good to know that you can actually have such an impact on people um i think it's an eye-opener too we get we get a lot of people realizing that you know they're sort of caught up in this weird weird reality that's created by all of crap on tv the propaganda and stuff and um and then when they spend time out in nature they it's a big realization that they're actually part of nature they're not part of these weird and strange worlds that have tried to be created by the system to keep people you know in the system and well we really do need uh, about a week to um to uh reset reset our body clock because we are quite attuned to um you know i don't want to call it the emfs the um uh, the frequency of, of being in the city and so to be able to reset all that you need to go back into nature yeah. you need to yeah. compress you, you and these are really essential. yeah well that's why people do it that's why there's you know it's probably the number one activity especially in australia is, is camping where families do it because it is a, and they don't even know it it's a big reset um, because we're meant, that's how we're meant to live, you know, uh, part of nature, not, not battling against it. I mean, I'm not saying we should all, you know, live like the Stone Age, not at all, but we certainly should be aware that, um, you know, some of the realities they're trying to create for people is, you know, these smart cities and all this crap. Um, that's not the be all and end all to, to living uh, on, on this planet, you know. Um, no one has to be a, you know, a, like full on, you know, Nazi about stuff, but certainly a self-realization that, hey, uh, you know, man-made systems can be broken. Um, they can fail. Um, we've got to be self-reliant. You know, we've always been a part of nature and we still are. Nothing's going to change. You know, consumerism's only been around you know, 70 years, I, I guess. Um, and before that, people were very, very self-sufficient, you know, um families have their ch chooks in the back garden and, and, and rabbits and stuff and that's just been lost in a couple of generations so w what we're seeing especially is young people who just want to learn all of that stuff um because it's been lost you know and they, and they say oh, i remember my nonna doing this and you know my granddad would do that and it's like so many people are wanting to go back to to that which is great. I think people should realise they need to be self-reliant and not rely on, you know, the government or whatever else. No, no, no one's going to help you. I mean, you can see it with bushfires and things like that. You're just pretty much left on your own half the time. The floods. So you, we really do. We really do need to be self-sufficient. And I don't think things are going to get better. In fact, I think things are going to get worse. Yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah. And that's why we can, if we can get out there and practice these things when... Yeah. It, Know, times are, are not pressing then we can actually have fun with it and then when think when it when it does you know the custard hits the fan then we can go into go mode and know what we're doing without freaking out and i think that's the most important thing is that if you can the custard i like that <laughs> <laughs> very polite <laughs> Yeah, there you go. that's me. <laughs> I, I paused on this photo because I really like this one of the the guy. Um, Which one? The guy Mia Lily. And oh he, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's what. Yeah, that's where we show um, the material that you've got to really look around and and think how you can use the different types of material we've got in the bush. You know, a lot of people don't look at surface area of something, and um, they'll just see the the, the guy Mia Lily and not figure out that wow, you know, you can really quickly weave these mats for for you know sitting on eating on sleeping on uh, overhead shelter um, and they give 
even just one layer of these, we found they give it probably about 95% um, like protection from rain. Right. And then if they do a second layer, it's even better. Um, and we're fortunate in the Sydney region because Gaimea lily only grows from just north of Newcastle down to about Wollongong. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not a huge area. So that's one of the really, really useful um, plants we've got. And we also show that you can, uh, on the young stems as they're coming up, um, you know, when they sort of head height, you can chop about 30, 40 centimetres of the tip off and just throw it in the fire as is like a corn cob um, and roast them up and they taste really, really nice. Wow. Um, that's a really good carb hit too. So you can use use the plant for food. You can use the old um, flower stems because they're quite long. They're metres and metres long. And they're, they're um, very lightweight but strong. They're not hollow like bamboo. They're quite strong, the dried ones. So you can use them for shelter, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, leaves are useful. The whole plant's useful. It's a really, really good, useful plant. Capturing water. For what? Sorry? Catching, yes, catching water. Yeah, if you, if you needed to to weave the mats into water catchment. By a couple of group shots. Oh, these are a few years old. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, the primitive pottery. We do that on the three-day primitive skills workshop. We, I teach students how to dig up clay, uh, add some additives called grog, G-R-O-G, <laughs> -G, um, which is just crushed, crushed up pre-fired clay. Um, you can also add things like river sand, which is more a temper because it hasn't been fired, but it's still useful. Uh, yeah, and then uh, make pots that you can cook with. So be because the uh, pottery in an open fire fires very, very low, uh, it's probably the minimum temperature you want for pottery. It's about 750 Celsius. Um, the walls of the pots are not fully sort of melted in the middle. So the outside surfaces are sintered. It's called sintering. And so they melt and join together and go hard, but the inside's still a fraction soft. And because of that reason, um, we can actually put like water or soup or whatever you know, on the inside of the bowl, and yet then put that bowl on a fire, which is burning at, you know, seven, 800, uh, and it's not gonna crack because of that softness in the middle. Wow. Um, so unlike high, fi uh, high fired porcelain and stuff like that, if you try and cook on an open fire, it's just gonna um, explode. Wow. And that's why primitive pottery actually works for cooking on an open fire. Well, that's very exciting to know. Yeah. And as far as I know, we're the only ones teaching that still, but sooner or later we'll have the copiers. Yeah. <laughs> it's always, this, always the case. Oh, yeah. Friction fire on the left, bow on the right. Yeah, there's the bow. Yeah. The gunya, ah, the small gunya, that's an Aboriginal, traditional Aboriginal shelter from down here. Um, it just fell over about a week and a half ago. <laughs> it's wow. uh, been up for probably about five years. I built that one four or five years ago. And that's traditionally um, traditional materials, I should say. Melaleuca bark and oh, there's some more pottery. Beautiful. And it's a very slow process doing the primitive pottery. You've got to heat the temperature up slowly. Fishing, we have a tidal river uh, where we the guys go fishing to catch their meal on day two. So it, it is uh, brackish, so we get, you know, sort of all sorts of good fish there. That's a brim you can see. Fantastic. My husband would be happy about that. Navigation, the, the gunya again. That's Joe teaching some cordage. Quite a few boats to the ice man stuff. Oh, some of these are quite old. Uh -huh. There's Fipsy, blacksmithing. You notice how many females we get on our courses. We, we really promote that. Um, I only mentioned, it's probably not, not anything new these days, but years ago, most of the guys that would go to survival things were, you know, very male oriented, you know, yeah. that whole macho sort of, I want to join the army type thing. And I, I purposely set out many, many years ago to, to you know, not ha have a wasted opportunity of, of females not wanting to come because it looks too, too macho. So, uh, hence the female instructors and 
Fantastic. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter whether you're a male or a female. Um, there's no, absolutely no difference for, for learning outdoor skills. So. So uh, for those in the chat, they were asking um, the website address. So it's AussieSurvivalInstructors.com. Yeah, www.AussieSurvivalInstructors.com. Yeah, it is a little bit dated website. I, I, as I said, I prefer to be on the ground out bush doing stuff, not at home, fixing up websites, etc. But it is something that does need to be done every now and then. That's what that is. And then, um, and then you're actually uh, uh, up by Pete's Ridge. Yeah, yeah, we're off. It's a, it's a um, valley. It's Glenworth Valley. A lot of the locals know it because it's, it's. They have horse riding and quad bike riding. It's owned by a, a private family, um, and they've been doing it, you know, for generations. Um, they're expanding a little bit now. They've got sort of like an event center and all that. So we meet our students at their main car park at their admin center and then we take them five kilometers on a four-wheel drive track uh, in my six by six ex-army truck um, and other vehicles yeah we take them about five kilometers south where we operate on the boundary of their valley which they don't use for anything which is perfect for us uh, years ago we used to operate on another property that they owned further west over Poprin national park way but that was um, sold off so we moved to this new spot, which is oh, so much better. We've got the tidal river. We, we get winds coming up in the afternoon in summer, which we never used to get at the old canyon. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic um, place. Like we, we used to have courses out in state forests and things like that. But now that we've got this, we don't, we don't bother because we're never going to beat it. <laughs> it's just great. You know, we've got cliffs and, and it was, um, the whole valley was occupied. Um, you know, before European people came here um, and af also afterwards for, for a little bit, if you do read the history, slowly they moved out of Sydney um, due to the, you know, the spread, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it was occupied and there's sites there that I've found um, which show the occupation, like artworks and stuff like that. But I don't, I don't take students or anything out of respect. But it's nice to know that, that um, yeah, it was it was used for, for probably tens of thousands of years, um, and I, I understand why because it's just such a great, great valley for, for so many resources. Um, you know, I say to my students that the, the bush is like a bunning store. You just got everything you need. It's it's really really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it is, especially if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Now, when we go on our weekend away. We're not we're not running a, a survival camp. That's that's for certain. No, no, you can see that. But there are a few camp. challenges that I do want to give um, give out to people so that we can be practicing things. Um, and um, and there's some things that I've been putting into the group, like you know, simple things: how to make a bedroll, how to uh, tie knots. I think you know, there's some really simple kind of camping ideas that that everybody should learn for, for, you know, everyday use. Mm -hmm. um, is there something, so I'll, I'll just share with you again, one of the things that I'll, um, that mm -hmm. we are going to do, and then maybe you can talk us through um, a few, like maybe some tips that would be useful. So um, let me just grab this up because nobody knows about this yet. So I've told them that if they complete 10, or 10 activities, that they're going to receive a bronze award. If they complete between 10 and 20, they'll get a silver award. And if they do more than 20, they'll get a gold award. And then we're giving out prizes uh, as well. Um, you know, as people upload um, their photos of the challenges that they're completing. Um, we're going to do some fun prizes for those things, but nobody knows what it is that I'm challenging them to do. <laughs> so I'll just read out a few of them and then um, and maybe you can give some tips for people. So one of the things that um, we, we're going to go in stages, right? So keeping it fairly easy and then some maybe more difficult things. Um, so some of them would be an observation. 
The other ones might be um, learning how to preserve and protect the environment that they're in, uh, demonstrate how to extinguish a fire, um, maybe how to light a fire, or how to e extinguish a fire if um, if it catch sparks catch on fire to nearby um, clothing or whatnot. Uh, another one would be how to start a fire without using matches, how to use a compass, um, how to sh give emergency for first aid for insects bites. Um, mm -hmm. The well, straight up the insect bite. Are you talking about modern medicine or bush medicine? Oh well. I because guess, yeah. A good, a good one that is really easy to remember for stings yeah. and bites. You know bracken fern, just common bracken fern. Yes. If you and they're there that you've got to be careful. You're not using the common mountain fern, which are soft. It's the ones that have the long, hard stalk, and they're dark green, and the leaves are quite hard. Bracken fern. Um, you can pull the, the the stem up out of the ground, and right at the base, if you chew it a bit and get it wet with your saliva, and then put that on the sting. That works a lot. That works really well. So, right. and it's pretty easy to find in the bush here. Um, you know, you see it everywhere. Um, modern equipment, if you want to put a good ointment into your um, medical kit, I like Soov S O O V over everything. Um, there's a lot of crap out there. Um, you know, one of them oh, I can't remember the common name, but it used to be popular years ago. It's just aluminium sulfate paste. It does nothing. So SOOV, S-O-O-V, and there's two types. There's one with 1% lignocaine, there's one with 3% lignocaine. Um, because what happens, it, it's good too, if you m could be sort of anaphylactic to anything, it'll stop the, your body pumping out the, the histamines. Um, so, you know, there'll be less chance um, because lignocaine is, is an anaesthetic and it works really well. Because I, I hate getting bit by those jack jumper ants, those really dangerous ones that... that sting rather than bite actually they're worse than hornets um and soothe works very very well but okay. if you've got nothing bracken for them but you there's no excuse really if people are watching this type of thing and and going out and doing stuff there's no excuse not to have all sorts of kit now they're really that's 2022 you know we got everything everything so right exactly and then yeah, yeah fantastic i love those tips um a compass how to use compass that's yeah we could talk about that but really it's, i think it's got to be hands-on um because you need to be seeing what's what's going on yeah but certainly um yeah a lot of people are confused i think who who've never picked one up the the magnetic needle will confuse them a lot um whether they're working with a map or or whatever they they can't They'll get confused once they do go onto a map. They're still looking at a magnetic needle, and there's no need to when you're working on a map. It becomes a protractor and a ruler, a compass, when you're working on a map. So I could explain, but people might not get it. But uh, in the real world, that's where the needle comes into um, its own importance because you, you know, you've got to put. Actually, I don't have a compass here. They're out. It's a shame. I could. <laughs> I like talking about this stuff. So. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but it's it is important. I think it's very important that people learn how to use a compass uh, with topo maps. There's so much information on topo maps, like hard copy topo maps. I do have some of those here because I'm planning a trip up to Nundle to get gemstones. Um, you can see the legend there. Loads of loads of information. Uh, one of the most important ones that I teach, and I think you might be able to see. It. Well, it's here. It's just yeah, you probably can't see it. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. A little blue dot and a little blue square, they're really important because they show, these are um, the third generation maps, they show, um, uh, what does it say here? Uh, water tank or reservoir, ground tank or dam. So the importance of that is, you know, there's going to be fresh water. Um, if you break down somewhere, there might be a farm, you know, 5Ks away, shown on here, and the water tank's going to be shown. So that's that's one of the most important things on these generation three ones now. Um, so that's really important is to learn how to use a compass with your topo maps. And even if you're not using the compass uh, to actually navigate anywhere, if you're broken down or something, like I just said, 
this had loads of information on him. Loads of information. So people, people shouldn't rely on technology for that type of stuff. Um, little GPSs and, and, and all that type of stuff, because if the batteries go, you know, you're pretty much yeah. pretty well stuffed. And I um, think people have stopped getting in the habit of collecting maps, but, um, you know, whilst we're putting together all the other things for our emergency equipment, um, collecting maps is a really smart thing to do. So, oh, absolutely. Um, if because if people are planning on a bug out uh, route, whether it's via vehicle or or on foot, then they'll need the topo maps for all the information to, to plan the routes. Uh, you know, any sort of off track stuff, if you're serious about bugging out in the bush or parts of bush to get out of cities and that, you, you'll need these because they'll show walking tracks, they'll show four wheel drive tracks. And even if there's a gate, um, you can still walk up them. You can still walk at night. Um, you know, um, you can't just grab, have a bug out bag and go, well, if anything happens, I'm just going to walk home. It's like, no, you're not, <laughs> because you probably won't know where to walk and you'd be using main roads or whatever when you could be using, you know, other, other ways to, to get out of whatever predicament. You know, and I was thinking about this today, um, even down in major cities, people don't think about simple things like... Um, rail lines or uh, stormwater drains which run all the way across the city as ways to get out of, of you know pretty nasty situations which could or couldn't happen but still have that mindset of all right what's an alternative um, route that I can take um, so I mean you could go on that topic a lot people just because I see it all the time too and in some of the, the face groups and stuff and i've been into this sort of stuff you know the last 20 odd years uh, it used to be called survivalists not preppers um they'll they'll focus on on the, the stuff they carry in their bag and half of it's just crap they don't need and not focus on the reality of all right well what if i do have to walk 30 kilometers out of a city what if i do have to take routes at night what if i do have to parts of the through bush um and they don't even practice walking with their heavy backpacks. Oh. You know? um, they don't wear a pair of boots in and see what it's like to walk in for two, three days. So it's okay to, to start out thinking, all right, I better pack a bag. Uh, but if, yeah, if they're thinking about walking anywhere, they better be serious about it and better start practicing because walking isn't fun. Um, 100%. Yeah, yeah. That, that's 100% because it, our survival of the fittest comes down to our fitness yeah absolutely yeah it's the mindset the psychology and and the fitness yeah yeah Beautiful. absolutely because no, did okay. you guys go through i had a quick look at the list i think you may have covered some bug out stuff like bags and stuff did you or yeah yeah so that's one of the things that i talk about a lot is what to put in a bag um you know how to pack it and, and even so we start with the kind of bag that you need to carry um, because when we did it a year ago, we just took the little cute little backpacks that we had in the house and got half an hour down the track and went, oh, that's so uncomfortable. That couldn't, couldn't sustain us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, my, I've got all sorts of stuff, but my main bushwalking backpack is Osprey, which is, I think they're either Canadian or American, but they have a, um, like they have a guarantee like anything breaks on it they'll replace it for free uh even if you chuck it off a cliff or whatever so they're, they're good quality they're comfortable um i used to do a lot of bow hunting as well so with bow hunting you don't want a big pack on your back so we have what's called belt kits uh -huh. i've got some stuff hanging there I'll grab it. Um, but this stuff is old uh, vietnam era uh, water bottles and pouches with a bit of first aid and even though it's like 50 years old this gear um, it's as good as the day it was made um, because I have tried modern pouches um, and zippers break and things fall off and um, yeah I always go back to that stuff yeah funnily enough um, it, it's a little bit heavy compared to modern stuff but it's still going you know 50 years later or Oh, yeah, 50. They're made to last. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the ex mil for for anyone looking at gear, a lot of the ex military stuff is pretty good, but you the weight is the issue, you know. So you've sort of got to try stuff out and then go with. You don't want everything to be too heavy, but certainly, you know, if it's lightweight and it's not going to stand up to what you need it for, then you just I use the military stuff. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, uh, some other things on the list that people might want to do on the weekend is uh, purify drinking water, um, identify cloud formations, um, how to treat someone who has fainted or is in shock, um, observe the stars and the sun um, and maybe find directions. Um, so yeah. not, north is magic. I'm lost. I have to find find north. That's the one I love hearing all the time. <laughs> it's like, no, well, you know where north is, but you're still lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one. Uh, what was one of the first ones you mentioned before the uh, purified drinking water? Yes. Okay. Purified drinking water. Um, obviously, you know, boiling uh, works. Um, one of the methods we actually get our students to do straight up from the minute they're at the four four day course um, and most of them are never heard of is simply using the sun, um, the UV rays and the heat from the sun. Um, it's called soda, solar disinfection. Uh, you may have seen the, uh, what are those battery operated things, the UV light called in the camping stores. Um, what's, uh, what's the difference to that? Because I thought was, the sun would make, um, Want to be turn allergy? So no, 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 no. The sun, the sun, using the sun, the UV rays from the sun is works better than any filter on the market. Wow, Pro proven it will kill viruses, whereas most of the filters on the market won't. They will only do bacteria and protozoa. Uh, so does solar disinfection. Um, uh, one when the water's when the water clarity is clear, yeah, it's the most, it's the purest form. Uh, of treatment you can do um it's literally just um i haven't got a clear bottle with me but oh i've got some pepsi here i'm drinking pepsi um if i take the label off this bottle i can fill that with water from the creek clear reasonably clear you will need to clarify it if it's not then you can do that through your, your jeans or whatever um six hours in the sun and it's perfectly drinkable water and it's killed any any pathogens in there uh, including viruses so there you, go, you can look it up, look it up. It's, um, most, you, you, you see a lot of the people in third world countries. That's why they have these bottles on their shanty roofs, like tin roofs and that. They're, well, that's what they're doing. They're just treating their water using the UV and heat. It's a combination. Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people aren't aware of that. No, if you left some water in, on the, in a bottle in the garden, there's no way it's going to um, turn to algae. Ah, okay. I just, I just, okay, when I go to clean my guinea pigs water, water, but that's because the guinea pigs are, are putting their um, saliva into it. I think that's for the reason then. Or uh, it may not be in the sun. Um, there's, yeah, it's open. It's always getting stuff in from the uh, wind. Okay. Um, it's not, it's not, yeah. I mean, now we've got three cats and the same thing happens to their bowls after a while you'll get it in the bottom, but that's different to actually treating in a closed. Uh, uh, that's the difference. Okay. okay. Oh, good. All right. Uh, some other things uh, could be uh, sanitization for your camp, um, disposing of um, garbage. See, simple things, um, but really important for the area. Um, planning a hike like what we talked about cooking using a, a campfire camp stove um okay some more about first aid learn how to fold a cravat bandage um, what you should put into your first aid kit now thinking about your first aid kit mm -hmm. um like you said before there's some really good modern things that should go into your first aid kit uh, and you did mention having um, a 
bought the wrong name. I'm going to fault Gravilli. What's the name of the plant that you said to use? The bracken fern. Oh, the bracken fern, yeah. Anything yeah, else that is a, a, a really good first aid? Um, yeah, well, there's a lot of topical ones which um, are very, very common, um, like leptospermum, for instance. The common name is tea tree. Um, that's a good topical one for cuts and things like that. Um, not the trouble with common names though is that they used on more than one plant. So when I say leptosperm or tea tree, I mean tea tree that you drink, not tea tree oil, which comes from Melaleuca, which is a different plant. Um, but we've got, I think, 80, 83, 84 species of leptospermum. Um, yeah, and you just crush the leaves and, and put it on any sort of wound or anything like that and you can wrap it with with the bark from melaleuca or even some clothing that's one offhand um there's a few few others which are good for say diarrhea like the the kino sap from that really bright sap from gum trees that reddish orange sap um, that's good to stop diarrhea but so is eating a little bit of charcoal um, yeah um, and there's plenty of books i've actually got one a book here, um, if you bear with me, I'll try and spot it for you to go. This is a good one for anyone into the medicinal stuff. Um, and, it, and it goes from, it, it is in um, the Latin name first, which can be confusing for, for people, but it's, um, you know, it'll, it'll say the family, the vernacular name, like yellow, the common name, Aboriginal name, description, habitat and distribution, medicinal uses. So, um, and it's like hundreds and hundreds of different plants. Now, I can't remember all of them, but I, I do sort of take note of the common ones that we might have in our area. Um, really useful, actually. Um, and the way they do the chapters too is like chapter six is skin disorders. Ah. Uh, so it'll be for what you're wanting to use it for and then it will have um have the plants the chapter two is narcotics and painkillers um, <laughs> it's a great book uh, chapter three is headaches colds and fevers maybe uh, we'll type the um name of that into the chat and then yeah. maybe i'll put it as a link into yeah, that's a really good one. So, in, you know, there's plenty of bush tucker stuff out there. It's dime a dozen, but the medicinal stuff, um, you know, is, is, is this is one of the better ones I've found. Um, but it's got Tim McCarthy's the, the author, and he's done plenty of other stuff. Australian medicinal plants. Um, by Tim by McCarthy. E, e. V. Lassac, L A S A K, and T McCarthy. And people can probably keep people will be able to pause this video and take a screenshot of it anyway. So. Perfect. Yeah. yeah loads of books I've got. You can see a lot in the background there. Um, it's it's the, the thing with uh, teaching I found too is is the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. <laughs> um, and it really keeps you grounded and humble because you you know put young people look up to me and go, oh, you know so much. And I think to myself, God, I don't know anything. <laughs> you know, there's so much to learn. Um, yeah. And you can't remember everything. You can yeah. you sort of, I, I try to, you know, be good in my local area, which is the East Coast of Australia, but I, I can't, you know, like if I was dropped in somewhere in, in say North Canada or somewhere, you know, I'd be the newbie, you know, so none of us are experts everywhere in the world. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And but the the most important thing I think that what would make you an expert is your observation, your mindset, you knowing how to um, be what to be aware of, and yeah, it's spending and time doing it. Um, whatever it is that you plan on doing, you know, if people want to be self reliant, then visit people who are already doing it, like the permaculture stuff you do. People go and learn, and then they start doing it. Then that's like any any subject. You got to be doing it. You got to get on the ground and start doing stuff. Um, and it's not hard to learn. <laughs> so now, as we wrap up tonight, 
Um, I just want everyone to get excited about some of the things that we're giving away as prizes for this little camp or, or what a challenge weekend. Um, and so some of our speakers who were on the summit have offered up some of their time as prizes, um, coaching and uh, by Nathan Mangard. He was one of our, our um, beautiful musician from, from South Africa, actually. So you get a Zoom time with him. Uh, and I've got some uh, vegan protein shake mix, which is fantastic for on the go um, food storage, but also for taking out on a, on a weekend like this, because you can just add water and shake and go. And that's a meal done. Um, and so there's some other prizes coming up. I don't know, Kevin, you might want to speak to me later and see if there's something that you want to, um, maybe add to the mix. So I won't put you on the spot <laughs> now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it'll be a fun weekend. And if you haven't already, if you're watching this and you haven't already registered, go to myselfreliance.com.au, register there um, and jump in, join in the fun. Tell us where, if you're, who's in your group. Um, it's so groups of family members or your team of up to six and it's $60 to register unless you're already a summit member and then you get it for 45. Uh, and that just helps me to um, send out the prizes and, and to look after you all for jumping in on that weekend. So any last words for you, Kevin, that you wanted to share? Anything that people should really know when they're kind of thinking about planning, um, you know, even going camping and not just for survival, but just, you know, being out in nature? What should people start thinking about? Uh, well, <laughs> that's, that's not going to be brief. Um, oh, geez, that's, that's put me on the spot. Um, I think, okay, anyone that goes out that you've got to think of one, tell someone where you're going for a start, depending on where you are going to have communications to, uh, loved ones. And that's not just mobile phone, but in, uh, say PLB or anything like that. And three, have enough stuff in your little backpack where if you, even if you're planning one or two hours out just say well i might break my ankle i might get stuck um so pack as if you're going to spend the night out overnight and, and there's lots of lightweight gear you're only going to add a few more things to your kit lightweight tarps etc a warmer jacket um yeah so that that's probably the three tell someone where you're going um and have the proper equipment to spend the night out if you have to and have proper communications uh, don't rely on a mobile phone mm, good that's for survival that's that's what we teach for survival not sort of bugging out and prepping so hope yeah. that helps yeah great tips well thank you so much for being with us tonight oh you're very welcome a lot. And i've seen the chat i don't know if anyone else in the com in the chat room wants to ask a com question but uh, Gail saying that she looks forward to your courses. Um, and so if anyone wants to find Kevin, go to Australian survival instructors.com and you'll find him there. You can see all about his courses there. And, um, yeah, if you want to drop in on us on the weekend that we are doing our camp, you're most welcome to Kev. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that, we can maybe free. I won't say it is free yet. I'll have to check. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Yep. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I will. Y yes, Gail. So I'm going to press stop record. Now, anyone who's been on our uh, calls before knows that all the good stuff happens after we press stop on the record. So you don't have to jump off just yet, but Thanks for if you're watching the replay and we'll catch you next Thursday, uh, sorry, next Tuesday. That'll be our last um, actual training. And then we have um, Jojo Sparks from Aussie Preppers um, Telegram group. She's going to come on and share with us what she does to prep. So look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks. Thanks again, Kev. 
Kelly recommends these nutritious fast foods for your grab and go bag. This vegan, non GMO, gluten and dairy free 72 hour pack provides you with loads of energy to keep you full for longer. Grab your summit special at myselfreliance.com.au and pick up a large protein shake free with your kit.